When home recording first became mainstream, it happened for one simple reason. The analog gear of decades past was slowly but surely being replaced by a new generation of audio interfaces and other digital gear that was cheaper and easier to use than ever before. And that trend has continued since. Today, digital audio is the standard for nearly all studios, both pro and amateur. Yet surprisingly few people really understand what it's all about. So for today's post, what I have for you is a comprehensive introduction to the basics of digital audio for music recording. These are the nine topics we will cover. The rise of the digital era. Digital converters explained. Sample rate. Bit depth. Quantization error. Dither. Latency. Master clocks. MP3 encoding. So let's begin. We'll start first with the rise of the digital era. While digital audio is the standard in music nowadays, it wasn't always that way. Originally, musical information existed only as sound waves in the air. Then, as technology advanced, people discovered ways of converting it to other formats, including notes on a page, electrical signals in a cable, radio waves in the atmosphere, bumps on a vinyl cord. But ultimately, with the rise of computers, digital audio became the dominant format for music recording because it allowed songs to be easily copied and transported for free. And the device that makes it all possible is the digital converter. To understand how they work, up next, digital converters explained. In the recording studio, digital converters exist in two forms. First, as a standalone device in high-end studios, or second, as part of the audio interface in home studios. To convert audio into binary code, they take tens of thousands of snapshots or samples per second to build an approximate picture of the analog waveform. The picture is not exact because in the moments between samples, the converter must essentially guess what's going on. As you can see the above diagram where the red line is the analog signal and the black line is the conversion. The results aren't perfect, but they're good enough to produce excellent sound quality. Exactly how excellent depends mostly upon the sample rate. Take a look at this picture. As you can see, by taking more snapshots per second, higher sample rates gather more real information, use less guesswork, build a far more accurate picture of the analog signal. And the end result is, of course, better sound quality. Now let's talk specific numbers. Common sample rates in pro audio include 44.1 kHz, which is CD audio, 48 kHz, 88.2 kHz, 96 kHz, 192 kHz. The 44.1 kHz minimum is due to a mathematical principle known as the Nyquist Shannon Sampling Theorem. To accurately record digital audio, converters must capture the full spectrum of human hearing, between 20 Hz to 20 kHz. According to the Nyquist-Shannon Sampling Theorem, capturing a specific frequency requires at least two samples for each cycle to measure both upper and lower points on the waveform. That means recording frequencies of up to 20 kHz require a sample rate of 40 kHz or more, which is why CD audio lies above that at 44.1 kHz. The cost of high sample rates. While high sample rates do produce better sound quality, the benefits aren't free. The costs include higher processing loads, lower track counts, larger audio files. So there's always a trade-off. Pro studios can more easily support the highest sample rates because they use better gear. For home studios though, most people find that a default setting of 48 kHz works best. Bit depth. To understand bit depth, let's first discuss bits. Short for binary digital, a bit is a single unit of binary code valued at either 1 or 0. The more bits used, more combinations are possible. For example, as you can see in the diagram below, 4 bits yields a total of 16 combinations. 
So 4 bits equals 16 combinations. When used to encode information, each of these numbers is assigned a specific value. By increasing the bits, the number of possible values grows exponentially. 4 bits equals 16 possible values. 8 bits equals 256 possible values. 16 bits equals 65,536 possible values. And 24 bits equals 16,777,216 possible values. With bit depth in digital audio, each value is assigned a specific amplitude on the audio waveform. The greater the bit depth, the more volume increments exist between loud and soft, and the greater the dynamic range of the recording. A good rule of thumb to remember is, for every extra bit, dynamic range increases by 6 decibels. For example, 4 bits equals 24 decibels, 8 bits equals 48 decibels, 16 bits equals 96 decibels, 24 bits equals 144 decibels. Ultimately, this means the more bit depth equals less noise, because by adding this extra headroom, the useful signal on the loud end of the spectrum can be recorded higher above the noise floor on the soft end of the spectrum. Quantization error. It sounds impressive that a 24-bit recording yields almost 17 million possible values, right? Yet, that's still far less than the infinite number of possible values that exist in an analog signal. So with almost every sample, the actual value lies somewhere in between two possible values. The converter's solution is to simply round it off or quantize it to the nearest value. The resulting distortion, known as quantization error, happens at two phases of the recording process. One, in the beginning, during AD conversion, and two, at the end, during mastering. With mastering, the sample rate bit depth of the final track is often reduced upon conversion to its final digital format, CD, MP3, and so on. When this happens, some information gets deleted and re-quantized, resulting in further distortion of the sound. To deal with this problem, there's a handy solution known as Dither. When reducing a 24-bit file down to a 16-bit file, Dither is used to essentially mask a large portion of the resulting distortion by adding a low level of random noise to the audio signal. Since the concept is hard to visualize with audio, the popular analogy used to explain it is dithering with images. Here's how it works. When a color photo is converted black and white, mathematical guesswork is done to determine whether each colored pixel should be quantized to a black pixel or a white pixel. Just like how guesswork is done to quantize digital audio samples. As you can see in the figure below, the before picture looks pretty crappy, doesn't it? But with Dither, a small number of white pixels are randomized into the black regions, and a small number of black pixels are randomized into the white regions. And by adding this random noise to the image, the after picture looks much better with audio dithering. The concept is very similar. With audio dithering, the concept is very similar. Latency. The one big flaw with digital studios today is the amount of time delay or latency that accumulates in a signal chain, especially with DAWs. With all the calculations that occur, it takes anywhere from a few milliseconds to a few dozen milliseconds for the audio signal to exit the system. With 0 to 11 milliseconds of delay, it's short enough that the average person won't notice anything. With 11 to 22 milliseconds, you hear an annoying slapback effect that takes some getting used to. With 22 milliseconds and above, the delay makes it impossible to play or sing in time with the track. In a typical digital signal chain, there are four stages that add to the total delay time. First, AD conversion. Second, DAW buffering, third, plug-in delay, and fourth, DA conversion. AD and DA conversion are the two smallest offenders contributing less than 5 milliseconds of delay. However, your DAW buffer and certain plugins, including Look Ahead, compressors and virtual instruments, can add up to 20, 30, 40 milliseconds or more. To keep it at a minimum, 1. Deactivate all unnecessary plugins while you're recording. And two, adjust your DAW buffer settings to find the shortest time your computer can handle without freezing. As you'll notice, 
Buffer times are measured in samples, not milliseconds. To convert it, divide the number of samples by the session sample rate in kilohertz to find the latency time in milliseconds. For example, 1024 samples divided by 44.1 kilohertz equals 23 milliseconds. If you hate doing math, here's an easier way to remember it at 44.1 kilohertz. 256 samples equals 6 milliseconds. 512 samples equals 12 milliseconds. And 1024 samples equals 24 milliseconds. In most cases, these steps should bring the latency down to a manageable level. But sometimes, if your gear is either too old or too cheap, it may not. In that case, the last resort. Many budget interfaces have a mix or blend knob, which allow you to combine the session playback with live signal being recorded. By splitting your live mic guitar signal and sending half to the computer to be recorded and half directly to your studio headphones, you avoid latency by sidestepping the signal chain entirely. The downside to this technique is you hear the live signal completely dry with zero effects. Hopefully though, since computers keep getting faster, this won't be an issue in the near future. Up next, master clocks. Whenever two or more devices exchange digital information in real time, their internal clocks must be synced so samples stay aligned, preventing those annoying clicks and pops in the audio that otherwise occur. To sync them, one device functions as the master and the rest as slaves. In simple home studios, the audio interface clock usually leads by default. In pro studios, which require premium digital conversion and complex signal routings, a special standalone device known as a digital master clock, aka world clock, can be used instead. As many owners claim, the sound benefit of these high-end clocks can be far less subtle than you might imagine. Up next, MP3 or AAC encoding. In today's world, compressed audio files are the norm in digital audio. Because with the limited storage space of iPods, smartphones, and internet streaming, all files must be as small as possible. Using a method of lossy data compression, MP3, AAC, and other similar formats can shrink audio files down to one-tenth of their original size. The encoding process works by using a simple principle of human hearing known as auditory masking, which makes it possible to delete tons of musical information while still maintaining acceptable levels of sound quality to most listeners. Experienced audio engineers might hear a difference, but the average consumer will not. Exactly how much information gets deleted depends on the bitrate of the file. With higher bit rates, less information is removed, and more detail is preserved. For example, with MP3, 320 kilobits per second is the maximum possible bitrate. 128 kilobits per second is the recommended minimum. 256 kilobits per second is the sweet spot that most people prefer. To find the ideal format and bitrate for your music, always double-check the recommendations of its destination.